All right, so welcome to those of you who are joining this webinar right now. Feel free to use the chat to tell us where you're from, uh, what state you're from, what organization you're from. We'd love to interact with you and engage with you throughout this session. Um, feel free to ask any questions there as well. Um, we know it'll take a little bit for everyone to join us, but um, before we get going into the content, we have quite a panel here with me. So I want to start by introducing us. Um, as a reminder, this webinar that you signed up for is Five Ways to Survive a CRM Breakup, uh, featuring a couple of us from Virtuous and then two of us from SJ Consulting. Um, we'll start on the Virtuous side. My name is Carly Berna. I'm the Director of Product Marketing at Virtuous. I spent 10 years in the nonprofit space as a fundraiser. And I'll get a little bit more into my background um, halfway through this presentation. And Ben, I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure thing. Thanks, Carly. Uh, great to meet everyone. My name is Ben Harney. I'm joining from the Virtuous Solutions Engineering team as a strategic solutions engineer. Similarly, always joke that nonprofit tech is kind of my bread and butter. Before Virtuous, I was overworking at Blackbaud, leading some of their Razor's Edge and Razor's Edge NXT uh, endeavors down there. So really excited to uh, talk with all of you this afternoon. Awesome. And we'll hand it over to SJ Consulting to introduce themselves. Hi, everybody. I'm Julie Gibson, president of SJ Consulting. I've worked with a lot of you joining the call today, and I'm, I'm looking forward to talking with the rest of you. We started the company in 2006. We've worked with a little north of 4,500 nonprofits over the last 18 years across uh, digital being web, email, as well as CRM. And we're excited for today's call to talk very specifically around CRM and a lot of the changes that we're seeing in the nonprofit space. And I'm Steve McLaughlin. I'm the Vice President of Client Success at SJ Consulting. Worked in and with the nonprofit sector for just about 20 years now. Uh, done everything from worked directly with nonprofit organizations, been on the board of a nonprofit, worked, taught, and uh, spent a lot of hands-on time with nonprofit organizations as well. So really excited about the opportunity to be here with Julie. So today's session is called Five Ways to Survive a CRM Breakup. And Julie and I are going to take turns on this first segment. You know, we together have seen thousands and thousands of CRM implementations, breakups, migrations, so on and so forth. And what we wanted to share today were some of the insights that we've learned over the years about not only sometimes why a CRM breakup happens, but more importantly, how do you su survive and thrive as an organization when these breakups happen? So for starters, there are lots of reasons why a nonprofit organization chooses to break up with their existing CRM provider. Uh, and just like with real relationships, there are a lot of parallels. Sometimes you just grow apart from your existing vendor. Uh, maybe you've had a lot of success. You've been able to scale the organization and some of the tools and technologies that worked for you previously no longer work for you today. Sometimes there are just some compatibility changes, challenges, right? Uh, it, but in the technology world, a lot of times this is a byproduct of you may have um, some challenges integrating multiple systems, challenges making sense of data that's coming from disparate places. And so there just may be some compatibility or some integration challenges that you deal with. Um, for a lot of organizations, one of the big challenges here is not getting support that you need, right? You have a, a diverse and complex set of needs and perhaps the tool uh, and the vendor that you're using today doesn't really work for you. Uh, it's not about you, it's about them. Maybe you have disagreements about money. Uh, another reason why breakups happen. Uh, perhaps, again, you're looking to consolidate from multiple vendors to a single vendor, or you're really getting trying to get a handle on your overall um, total cost of ownership when it comes to the, all the solutions that you're using today. And then sometimes it just comes down to a lack of trust and respect. Perhaps you've had some turbulence, some issues, some challenges over the years, and it's one of the reasons that ultimately has led you to 
to make the decision or about to make the decision to break up with your existing CRM provider. Now, these are just a few of the reasons why organizations choose to break up with their CRM. And ultimately, it doesn't really matter as much of why you chose to do it. Um, Julie and I really strongly believe it's all about what are you going to do to make sure that you can be successful post-breakup? And so what we want to share are five of the big ways that organizations can successfully survive a breakup. So we're going to start with reason or way number one. So number one, you got to look after your data. Um, I am a big believer that if you were to look on the balance sheet of a nonprofit organization, the most valuable asset that should be on that balance sheet, although probably isn't, is your data, that constituent data, that gift data, that relationship data, that historical data, that longitudinal data that goes back years and years and years and years. And it's extremely valuable. And so there's a reason we put this as number one of why it is so important that you, uh, the key to surviving and thriving after a CRM breakup is for you to look after your data. Now, we know that data comes in lots of different shapes, sizes, conditions, and also comes from a lot of sources. And so as you're planning your, uh, um, your breakup and uh, also preparing to get into a new CRM relationship, this is a great opportunity to take a stock of all of the data that you have today, right? Where is that data stored today? In which systems? Who has access to that data? Um, we also uh, acknowledge and see this all the time that oftentimes data is in lots of different places. Uh, and that's okay. You may have data in your current donor management system. You probably have data in sheets. You probably have data in notes. You probably have data in lots of other systems. That's okay. There's a great opportunity now to make sure that you're pulling that data together and that that data comes along during this transition as you're moving from one um, CRM solution to another. So we really start with this as a, a core concept. Make sure you're taking care of your data. And Julie, I know you've certainly seen this over the years, the importance of organizations getting their data together and thinking about how is it they intend to make that move with their data as a part of uh, going to a new solution. 100%. You know, so many different teams across organizations will use their data in different ways, and then it becomes very siloed instead of having a holistic, centralized source of truth, if you will, for all of your data, whether it's foundations and corporations, grants, uh, donors, major donors, uh, maybe smaller donors who have come in through peer-to-peer -peer fundraising uh, through your constituents, tributes, estate giving. they are all types of uh, constituents that are maybe being utilized across different teams and uh, and also those sources, whether it's HubSpot, MailChimp, sort of exporting and importing, but you never really have that centralized. So working together and, and sort of envisioning what that could be on a very streamlined path then becomes back to what Steve said, really part of that uh, underscored value to your organization and how you can move forward with growing your constituent base and your, your donations, your volunteers, whatever that uh, specific outreaches that you're looking to do. Yeah, it's a great point, Julian. And, and certainly there's an opportunity as a part of a moving to a new solution to look at that data and decide what you want to do. Um, the other point I would add here, and this is one of my favorite uh, cartoons from The New Yorker, um, and the caption at the bottom is, the new house is almost ready. And our friend here has essentially rebuilt a new house, except it's exactly like the old house. And there's a sort of a tale of caution here with your data. As you are moving from one solution to another, or in some cases, and we see this all the time, you've got lots of solutions today, and you've got to consolidate, merge that data, and bring it to a new destination. Just because you have all of it today does not mean you have to bring all of it with you. Um, in a lot of cases, and this is very common, Julie and I see this all the time, there's an opportunity to do um, a, a good exercise of 
uh, a deduplication, uh, a good merge purge practice. Before you move everything from the old house, if you will, to the new house, there's an opportunity to clean up and improve the overall quality of the data so that when it comes over, um, you're not only in your new house, but in, in many ways, it's new and refreshed data. I know something, Julie, that you've recommended to, to clients over the years is to take a hard look at their data. And if there are opportunities to clean it up as a part of a migration, that's something you encourage. Absolutely. I, as you mentioned, the duplication, that's, that's huge, especially when you have disparate data sources, because Julie Gibson, for example, could be in multiple different data sets and to have one holistic view of all the interaction I've had with your organization or potentially could have with your organization that clean up on a constituent level, on a gift level, which attributes to your accounting system. Looking back and seeing if a donor last gave 15 years ago $5, but they've never interacted since. There are a lot of if then type of logic that you can bake in before you move into your new clean CRM. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, the second way to survive a CRM breakup is get your support network ready. Um, any type of change, organizational change, leadership change, technology change brings with it change. And um, as humans, we like change, but we don't like changing. And so we always recommend that you've got your core support network together, right? Have you communicated to leadership about this change? What does it mean for the organization? What does it mean for organizational goals and pro in some cases, your board of directors may be involved in the change, or at the very least, they need to be aware about what's happening. The other thing that we think is really important is that all of the different departments that you work with on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis, fundraise, finance, marketing, IT, programs, they're not only aware of this breakup, but also the change and what do you need from them to make this change successful. And Julia, I know this is an area you've had a lot of experience with of helping uh, organizations prepare for this change, whether that's somebody at the leadership level or someone in an individual contributor role to be prepared for the overall change, right? Right, and it's not only how each of these sometimes very siloed groups of individuals are using your, your data to date, uh, it's how they've been using the challenges they've had, the sort of wish list, or if I could only do X. And um, thinking across uh, all of the different teams, all of the different touch points, from your board of directors to the, the administrator of your database, to your marketing and fundraising teams who are dealing with the website, with the email outreach, and ensuring that everyone is talking about what those challenges and wish lists are, so that when you're moving into that new CRM and hopefully has, you know, either the inherent functionality of what these different teams need from reporting to outbound emails and drip campaigns, et cetera, that they're all seeing what are those changes potentially good in the new system and maybe may take three months, six months to sort of get used to these changes, but then the art of the possible opens up. Yeah, great point. So as we move on to way number three, uh, here's something we want you to consider. Um, preference is not process. You have a solution today. Your coworkers have a solution today. You're used to using it. But in some cases, or in a lot of cases, things are going to change. And the example you like to use here is the difference between Apple and Android. Um, I found in general, there are Apple iPhone people and there are Android phone people. And a lot of times it's about personal preference. I like to do it this way. I prefer to do it this way. I've always done it this way. And one of the things you need to prepare for as, as a part of moving from um, you know, a current solution to a new solution is you need to take a hard look at are some of your decisions being driven by preference, I like that, or process. This is how we need to operate as an organization. And there's a little bit of tough love for, for going on here for sure. Because again, your current system may look a certain way, may work a certain way, but as you're moving from your current CRM to your new CRM, 
we really recommend you've got to think about, okay, is, is, is something that's holding us up on making a decision or something that we're really struggling with, is that preference or is that process? And wherever possible, as you transition and you move to the new system, focus on process, right? Focus on, okay, how will things work today? I know we may have done it slightly different in the past, right? But part of the, you know, if everything was perfect, you'd still be in the relationship, but you're not, you've decided to move on, right? So moving on is partly, there is change involved. And so uh, focus on process, not individual preferences as you move forward to start using um, other tools. And okay. I, I was just gonna chime in from, yeah. you know, from anytime you're moving between platforms, you're gonna have visual changes, that's a given. You might still find specific aspects of records in, uh, you know, a landing view of a constituent record or a contact record, but there are ways visually and functionally to improve uh, what you're getting out of your CRM. And, you know, so many times in, in, a, in a breakup, I've had clients say, I don't want to do this anymore. In addition to, I'd really like to do that. So there are functional, visual, and then nomenclature. So many nomenclature changes uh, occur during a CRM transition, um, but it's all of that ability to in improve your processing and your visibility, your accessing of data, uh, and then sort of restart the story of how you're gonna be communicating and looking at all of your constituents and contacts. Yeah, and part of it's just managing the change with your team, right? Um, which leads us to, to Number four, focus on the transitions. Um, when change is happening, it's very common for people to really focus on the change. And it's not the change that's gonna cause the problems, it's the transitions. And so here, we've got current performance. Here's where we are today. We wanna move and improve to future performance. But this is not a straight line. Julie and I have been doing this for 20 years. It is not a straight line. It's actually a curved line. And there's actually a, a, a psychological model for this. Kubler ross change curve, right? And what they found through lots and lots of research of humans, which is what we're dealing with here, even though there's software involved, is that anytime there's a major change that happens, there's a dip um, when you're trying to move from current performance to an improved future performance. There is always a dip, and so the thing that Julie and I always constantly focus on during um, implementations and projects with our clients is there will be a dip, but there is a lot of things that you can do to minimize that dip. Right? How do you prepare your data? Um, how do you prepare your team and stakeholders? How do you focus more on process, not preferences? And so time and time again, we see with these projects, yes, um, there may be a little bit of a dip, right? People are adjusting to a new system, a new way of doing things, but there are things you can absolutely do in advance to minimize that dip as much as possible. And if I could just speak real quickly on, on that piece of it, where a lot of uh, consultants and, and SJ speaking specifically here will come into play to really minimize what Steve was just talking about, being trained on your new CRM throughout the process of migration instead of waiting till post migration. Um, Virtuous does a great job of opening up an academy the moment uh, a client decides to go with Virtuous CRM. But with, with consultancies like ours, we're able to then start really hands-on training you on the use of the nomenclature of the placement of all this data that you've, you're so used to being in these three, 10, 16, 48 boxes of your old system. Where are those going to be? How are you going to use this information moving forward? How do you need to think about some of these changes that might be happening from fund to project or constituent code to tag or any and all points in between? so that you're making the right decisions throughout the process of your journey. And then when you get to the final line, you're able to really deep dive and start using it much quicker than if you wait till the end. Yeah, it's a great point. And, you know, we found a lot of 
successful implementations are helped by doing training earlier in the process than maybe some other um, vendors choose to do things. And once you start to see your data in the new solution, um, it really helps to build confidence and also just gets you uh, acclimatized to the new solution that you and your team are going to be using. Okay, so we're going to wrap up with way number five to survive a CRM breakup. And uh, it's ending on a high note, which is something that's really important, right? Get excited for your future. Um, some of these implementations take weeks or months. There's a lot of change involved. There's a lot of hard work involved. But we do find time and time again the importance of being excited about this change. And one of the things that we often do when we're checking in clients on the progress of their um, implementation as they're making this move is just asking things at a kickoff call like, hey, 90 days from now, we'll feel, how are we going to feel 90 days from now? Ooh, we, nervous. Okay. What could we do today that would make you feel less nervous about that? Uh, six months from now, how are we going to feel? Oh, six months from now, we're hoping to be done. Great. How do you want to feel six months from now? We want to feel like we made the right choice. Great. Uh, how do we make sure that you and the team feel that way? And again, these are just things that we know from thousands and thousands of projects that, that you can head off in advance by preparing not only you, but your different stakeholders, different people in leadership positions across the organizations, as well as yourself to build confidence and to, to get excited about your future. Julie, any closing thoughts here before we uh, hand things back to the Virtuous team? Um, this th this slide is actually a, a fun one early on in projects to talk to the different teams who are going to be involved throughout the process. And sometimes, uh, you know, leadership, for example, may be involved in the very beginning or perhaps a couple of board members, and then they don't really circle back into the end. But getting this type of assessment is always a fun one to sort of track throughout the duration of a project from the, the main points of contact throughout the duration, um, you know, in, in involving some of those others to get the temperature gauge along the way. It's, it's, it is an exciting uh, process to take. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Julie, thanks for tag teaming with me here on this. And uh, we're gonna hand things back to Carly and the Virtuous team. And uh, we'll stick around for your questions as well towards the end. Carly? Thank you. Yep, thanks, Steve. Um, you know, it's interesting that little graph you just showed um, when I was going through my own CRM transition, that big dip at the bottom, we called the pit of despair, which if you look at uh, that, the actual meanings of each of those uh, stages, that's what it's called the pit of despair, which is sometimes what it feels like at some point of a CRM transition. Um, so I mentioned in the beginning that I'd talk a little bit more about my background. I was the chief marketing and development officer at a medium-sized nonprofit and three years into my time there, I was there for 10 years, we had to go through a CRM transition. Um, at the time we were on Blackbaud and we just didn't have the tools that we needed to be able to scale and fundraise and market the way that we needed to. So we started looking um, for other CRMs, went through a full RFP process and we did end up um, choosing Virtuous. But I led the CRM transition project, which was very painful, but very much worth it. Um, a lot of the pain points we had were things that you may be experiencing. We had multi-systems, our marketing was in one database, our um, mail was in another database. There was no ability to see the full view of the donor. So what were they doing? What were they interacting with? We couldn't see that it, because it was in two different systems. Uh, the user interface was really hard to use. It wasn't very intuitive for staff trying to navigate and figure things out. Um, the product at the time really didn't have any innovation, and we were really looking to scale and try and do new things, especially as digital fundraising was coming around at that time. And there was no ability to customize the platform or integrate with other systems. So we had a lot of other um, technology systems as well as vendors that we wanted to do integrations with. And so it was a lot of downloading and re-uploading CSV files. So that was a lot of our pain points. and. You know, I like to talk about this idea of when is it time to change uh, and that sentence at the top there when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change is when it's time to change. So 
Meaning that when staying in your current system is more painful than the idea of changing, which will be painful, but it will be worth it. Uh, and for me, it definitely was worth the pain of change. We spent way less time managing our technology and instead more time spent on strat marketing and fundraising strategy, as well as donor relationships. Um, Virtuous has a lot of automation features, which allowed us to save a lot of staff time. We could see a full view of the donor, which allowed us to um, make more personal connections with each of our donors and allow them to feel like they were really part of our organization. And in the end, we raised more money and had greater missional impact, which is really what we're trying to do as nonprofits. Um, so I want to talk briefly about um, what makes Virtuous different, and then Ben's going to walk us through uh, a quick demo of some of Virtuous's features. So in the nonprofit space, um, one of the problems is that there's just like a lot of one-to-many donor experiences, right? We send out a lot of mass communications, and so our donors just feel like they're just getting a mass communication. Um, but in the world that we live in, uh, fundraising and even businesses have really changed. So if you have Netflix or Hulu or Amazon, you know this because you sign into those systems and you feel like they know you, right? They're offering you the exact type of documentary that you wanna watch or the exact type of product that you would be interested in. And it feels very personal, but why don't we have that in the nonprofit space? And that's what we're really trying to do at Virtuous. We're trying to have a more responsive model for generosity. And that's our goal is to grow generosity alongside nonprofits. So we call this the responsive fundraising model. And you'll see on the screen here, there's four different pillars of this, which I'll go through real quick here. Um, the first one is to listen. And this is really to listen to what your donors are saying, how they're behaving. And they can tell you these things through the way they're interacting on their social media or wealth insights or how they're interacting with your website, um, what types of causes they're giving to. Um, the second stage is to use that information to then connect personally with them. Uh, and using automation can help you do that on a way that can scale. So you're not manually trying to connect with all of these different personal behaviors and signals that you're learning. Third is to suggest the next right step. So every donor has a different next right step. That could be a donation. It could be a volunteer experience. It could be engaging on social media in some way. It could be a monthly gift. There's a next right, right step for each person. And so that's the third step in responsive fundraising. And then the fourth is to learn. So to continue to test and validate and become even more responsive. So again, that our donors feel like we know them, um, that we have personal connections with them, and that you can continue to have those personal connections at scale. So Virtuous is more than just a donor database. You might have a CRM or maybe a database that houses all of your contacts or all of your donor information. Um, and maybe you have other tools that do other pieces of the marketing and fundraising puzzle, but Virtuous does more than just manage your donor data. Um, we say that Virtuous is a responsive fundraising platform. And like I was mentioning, it's built so that you can have more personal connections with your donors and grow giving for your organization. Um, one of the things that I love about uh, the Virtuous platform is that it's really made for fundraising and marketing teams. Uh, it's very easy to use, very intuitive. I had to train multiple teams on it. And uh, once they got into the system, it's they can figure out how to use the system in a way without having to kind of go back and go through all of the training um, just because it has a super easy to use interface. Uh, as a major donor or donor development officer, it has great powerful tools for moves management. Uh, you're able to manage your caseload, manage the pipeline of the gifts coming in, and even forecast what your major donors may possibly give in a certain time frame. Uh, marketing is integrated right into Virtuous, which for me, that was a huge issue. We had a separate marketing uh, tool that we were using. So to have everything in one place with email, text, and campaigns all in one place was extremely helpful. And the email tool has uh, great features like A-B tests, 
dynamic content so you can customize your emails based on the personal information you know about your donors. And again, because it's all in one system, you can use all that information you know about each donor from Virtuous right in your email tool. And really the secret sauce of Virtuous is automation. Uh, and this isn't just external communications automation, which is a huge part of this. You can automate postcards, letters, texts, emails, et cetera, but you can also do internal automation. Uh, and what this means is some of the manual tasks that you or maybe your data team is doing inside of your database, you can use automation um, to do these things. So maybe uh, if someone becomes a volunteer and then you have to create all sorts of segmentation and tagging or flagging, uh, when someone becomes a volunteer, you can have Virtuous do all of that automated. So there's a lot of internal time savings as well as the external automation communication. Uh, Virtuous has a whole platform for events uh, that you can use if you are an organization that hosts events. Uh, there's also, like I talked a lot about, there's a lot of different signals that show behavior insights, wealth insights, social insights. You can see when someone interacts with your website so that you could then communicate to them based on that website interaction or call them based on what they were looking at and have that conversation. So again, very personal. And then we have a dedicated volunteer system as well. Um, so if you are an organization that leans heavy on volunteer recruitment, uh, there's definitely a solution for volunteering. And if you have a give, separate giving platform, that's another piece that makes it extremely, um, it has a great integration with Virtuous is that your giving platform, we have a giving platform within Virtuous and it allows you to use that Virtuous data you have about your contacts right within the giving platform. So you can do things like dynamic ask arrays based on that donor's past giving history um, or upgrading them to a monthly gift with a different ask amounts. Uh, and again, this is because all of that information that the giving platform is pulling from is from the Virtuous database. So having all of that data in one place is so helpful when you're trying to execute on all of your fundraising and marketing goals. So that was just a quick overview of what responsive fundraising is and some of the tools of Virtuous, but I'm gonna hand it over to Ben. I'll stop sharing my screen here so that he can show you the platform in action. Absolutely, thank you, Carly. Well, everyone, let me get my screen shared for you here. And uh, let's start taking a look at some of those items that we've been leading up to up to this point. So I really loved, uh, that metaphor of thinking about our usage of the CRM as like a relationship, right? So I want to circle back to two of those items that Steve and Julia had been bringing up. One with protecting our, our data, right? Treating our data, our system, our CRM with that respect of, hey, this is the data that is really in many ways, like Steve mentioned, the lifeblood of all of this fundraising that we're doing, but then using that respect, right? Using that treatment of our data, of our CRM to empower those responsive endeavors that Carly was bringing up, right? Achieving that single source of truth, that single bastion of good, healthy data like Julie was talking about. So let's kind of start at just the beginning of that life cycle, right? Where kind of a lot of the data begins with what we're tracking here in our CRM. And that's going to be with just the source of, well, the other lifeblood to our organizations, right? The source of our gifts. So those are going to be coming into our system in a couple of different avenues, right? So for one, probably going to be looking for those online gifts. As Carly was mentioning in that last slide, right? We're going to have that uh, native giving system directly within Virtuous, we're going to be able to use things like that dynamic ask array. So part of responsive fundraising being referencing what does Ben's giving history look like versus what does Carly's giving history look like? Hey, maybe Ben is visiting this page. I'm a first time donor. I'm going to be seeing suggestions that are appropriate for a first time donor. Maybe Carly visits this page. Carly has been donating $500 time and time and time again. Well, that smart ask array is probably going to suggest starting at 500, maybe going up to 750, maybe going up to a thousand dollars, right? If I'm here given a would be one time gift, Hey, maybe it's going to stop me. Ben, would you like to consider making that more of a recurring gift there? Maybe it's not going to be an online gift that we're collecting 
from our donors to that online portal. Maybe it's going to be more of like a major gift solicitation that we're actively planning and strategizing and tracking, right? We'll be able to do the same thing with the gift ask pipeline here. I can switch between looking at the uh, major gift solicitations across my whole team for individual fundraisers. I can change what date we're looking at that. And this gives me that holistic, again, bird's eye, single source of truth for how much of that money is in my pipeline right now? How much of that is forecasted to close? How much have I actually fundraised? How much have I actually made in progress towards my goal? So again, this is us collecting that data, right? This is us getting at those gifts, getting that lifeblood. We're going to see some of those protections come into play here with our gift import data health screens. So whenever the gift information is coming in, it's going to actually be screening it against multiple different data points. You see those different categories here at the bottom, gift information that's tracked and connected to an existing donor, bam, automatically put in the ready for import category. There's nothing that you as a user, as a fundraiser have to do because 100% of that data is lining up with an existing donor. Flip side, none of that information is lining up with an existing donor. That's a match needed gift. We need to actually create a new donor record. If update is needed, hey, that's someone where there's a little bit of a discrepancy. We need to choose. Hey, Ben entered a gift as Benjamin. Should we update that with his full name? Hey, Carly used her work email instead of her personal email that we had. Should we leave the old email? Should we update with the new email? It's acting as that, again, data health screen to give us that pulse check, say, hey, what do we want to do with this new data when it's coming through rather than just letting the data kind of wantonly enter the system? Now, like we said, this is all important to make the data actionable. It is our life, but uh, life blood it is going to be empowering these other features that we're going to use to become truly responsive as an organization, as a fundraising team. So this is where, like Carly was saying, automation really becomes the key. Huge difference here, like Carly was mentioning, with the different types of uh, steps of actions that are being automated, right? Internal or external. Yes, we've got that whole marketing engine automatically sending texts, automatically sending emails, even automatically sending letters on your behalf. But a huge part of it will also be automatically updating the database based on the criteria and the parameters that you've put in place. So perhaps uh, tagging your donors in certain capacities, putting them into different segments or different differentiating groups, maybe updating fields on them, putting them in certain uh, fundraisers' portfolios, right? Helping the system really keep itself up to date to assist us in that capacity. So we are going to have a few different uh, templates that will kind of give you a starting point here for really more of those common, generally used uh, workflows, right? Things like automatic birthday wishes or automatic life to date giving or volunteer hour milestones. But I really like to start with more of a classic new donor welcome series. I'm sure that all of us in this group are uh, very attuned to all the research, the studies that are out there that show how impactful new donor welcome sequences are. I always call it the billboard metric because it's always the one blown up in big bright, shiny lights, but a donor who is engaged in those first 30 days after their first gift, they're generally going to have a higher lifetime value by about 300% than a donor who is really not engaged in that initial honeymoon period. So one, new donor welcome, very impactful, but if it's automated, that impact is not uh, a trade-off with the time, the bandwidth, the investment that our team is putting in because it's automated. We can really set it and forget it, let our system respond to it. So what you see going on in mind here, we've got our first time donor branch captured by when folks give that first gift. It's gonna start with some segmentation, tag them as being a first time donor, also tag them indicating, hey, they are currently in the new donor welcome sequence. If I was sending out some other, maybe an email blast, hey, I don't wanna overwhelm the inbox of my new donors. I want them focused on this welcome sequence. Well, hey, we can automatically filter anyone with that tag out. Again, we're not worried, hey, is that actually up to date? Is this going to appropriately filter out the folks I want to filter out? The system has kept itself up to date in that regard. It'll run that automatic wealth screening. Now it starts off that multi-channel outreach, again, through the marketing engine, automatically sending an email, sending a postcard in the mail, sending a text message, 
Of course, the one thing the computer can't really do is call someone up and have a personalized phone call, right? So that becomes a task for one of our team members, but then it finishes off with one more email before it removes the tag. Hey, this donor has finished that new donor welcome sequence. They can be filtered into any other email blast you'd like. Hey, when they give their second gift, right? Remove that tag. They are no longer a first time donor. They have been retained with that second gift. And we can extrapolate this as much as your team would really like. I have another branch here for maybe a first time gift that is above a major donor threshold, but that is a customization that you could absolutely optimize to whatever your team needs to accomplish. And for the cherry on top, all that information, that engagement, that activity is all appended back to that donor's record. And back to our idea of a single source of truth, we get a single activity feed. Now, it's very granular. A lot of filters as individual team members, we probably all have different priorities. We could set those filters to show exactly what's relevant to us. Or we could open the floodgates, say, I want to know everything that's happening with our donors you're never going to miss a step. It all gets added here, whether that is engagement on the donor's side, opening our emails, visiting our website, whether it's an audit trail for what our team is actually updating on their record or anything else, we get the access to it. There's not going to be any more blind spots as far as how we engage with our supporters. So my friends, I'm going to pause there. I know we've got some conversation happening over in the chat here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Carly, Steve, and Julie, I believe we have some time for a Q&A now. Is that correct? Yes, we can do a Q&A. I, I see, Julie, that you're answering a lot of the questions in there, so I don't know if there's anything you want to address. Uh, I think William and I were kind of tag teaming. <laughs> uh, Beautiful. I, was, I saw somebody coming in. I just thought I could chime in on a few of them. So, um, no, I, I'm here for anyone to ask any specific questions outside of what um, you all want to answer from a product perspective, or maybe it's more process oriented that they want to ask some questions for. Yeah. Okay. Feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Um, in the meantime, uh, I just want to share here. This would be the next steps based on this conversation. If you're interested in learning more about Virtuous, um, you can schedule a demo and we can walk through how your organization could work with Virtuous. Uh, or if you are in that process of your CRM breakup and trying to figure out what your next steps are, uh, you can contact um, SJ Consulting with the, e the email right there, info at sjconsulting.us, and they can help you go through that CRM breakup. But there is a good question in the chat here, if, if you guys want to answer it. How far in advance do you suggest starting to plan for a breakup? So yeah, that's, that's a really, really good question. Julie, you want to fire away? and Sure. And sometimes it, it also will depend on how many uh, sources of data you have, what's the volume of your data. So if you have a million constituents versus 50,000 constituents, that timeline can kind of vary. Um, but we always recommend a, a discovery and planning phase to kick off the transition or the migration between CRMs <clears throat> for your breakup. And the, the discovery can be anywhere from just a couple of weeks if you have a really small data pool and not a lot of complexities to a month or two to ensure that we're talking to all the parties who really need to be involved. Uh, in those discussions, we're looking at all of your different data sources, we're talking through changes that you may want to make, challenges you've had. So, um, you know, I would say the entire migration uh, timeline could range anywhere from, I think Steve, you originally mentioned, you know, we've seen it as short as six weeks from start to finish. We start discovery, you're live, smaller constituent pool or of data to um, about six months to ensure that we're really doing all the due diligence across all the different teams and, and platforms. Um, and so when you're when you're coming up on a due date for your con contract with it, with your current CRM, we always try to backtrack from that point and ensure that you have a good month of overlap so that you still have access to your old system a month for a full month after you've gone live with Virtuous. And the reason for that is there may be some 
small constituent attribute or a custom field or an event that you just didn't think about during the course of the project that all of a sudden you do want to have uh, brought over, or you may want to have a comparison in your reports, the BI reports in Virtuous versus some of the reports you had done in NXT as an example. Are things really correlating to make sure that you have everything that you wanted out of the system? So um, then you would just backtrack and say, if we have two weeks to a month of overlap, that's your, your go live date at that point, you know, and backtracking from there based on your, your data needs. And we can talk through uh, specific timelines, you know, if you, if you uh, uh, reach out to us and talk about some of your data and your sort of goals throughout the process. Yeah, I'll just add that um, it can sound very overwhelming. Uh, I know we did it when I did our, my CRM transition, we did it ourselves and I wish we would have used a partner uh, to help through all the things that you're talking about. Like here's, you know, we, you've been through many CRM transitions. Here's the best way to walk through the timeline and, you know, the best practices and all of that. I really wish we would have used an implementation partner to help us. Well, and because we've seen a lot, right, we, to your point, we've yeah. seen a lot, we've experienced a lot, we know where things can be streamlined, we know where gotchas are going to, going to occur in certain uh, areas throughout the timeline, and we can avoid those because we've seen so much and worked with so many wonderful nonprofits. Um, and, you know, outside of the CRM, you also have to think about all those influencers, like your forms, and ensuring you have time for form build out, um, emails, making sure that you have email templates and all of your automations and dashboards and your security and so many different things that we sort of shoulder a lot of that um, onus and walk you through it in sort of bite-sized pieces. And that way nobody feels overwhelmed at the end of the line. Yeah, yeah, that's great. All right, um, I wanna make sure that we stick to our timing here. So again, if you want to request a virtuous demo, you can do that. I put the link in the chat. There's also a call to action button here on the screen. And if you'd like to talk to SJ Consulting, again, you can contact them at the email on the screen. If you're interested, you can view this webinar again. If there was something you wanted to go back to or watch or listen to, you should get a link after this is over so that you can uh, watch it again. Um, so thanks for joining us. Thanks, SJ Consulting, for joining us. Great to have you with us. Um, and we hope you all have a great rest of your day. Happy summer, everybody. Talk soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.